Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. When you're feeling terrible and you're not motivated, you're like, well, at least I can get up and go for a run. I'll go for a run. Yeah. You know, because he can't. And and that's actually a really good point because I didn't know any of this when we'd worked together. I never knew what you were doing. And then when we added each other on social media, all of a sudden I see this face talking to the camera every night. And it was brilliant. And I was like, why is this why is Beck running all of a sudden? Is she going on a fitness fitness kick here? Is it changing her life for some reason? But there's more to it, isn't it? The runs, there's more to it with the runs. What are what are the runs all about? Well, I do love running. So yeah. Thing. That helps. <laughs> it was a, like, I'm a mum of four. I love getting out of the house when I can. Yeah. So it was something solely for me. Okay. But also I thought, well, how can I bring some form of awareness about why I'm doing this as well? And I think a lot of it is grief too, holding on to something and hopefully just letting go of a bit of that weight too. I remember it. I can't remember who said it, but I can remember this analogy of like, imagine if you were carrying rocks all day long mm. and then at the end of the day, you finally let go of them, how light your arms feel and how tired your body is, but lighter because you've let go of this. And I feel like I get to a point where I'm light-ish, but I'm not as light as I can be because I've still got this rock that I'm holding on to and haven't let go of yet. And I don't think we'll ever let go of, mm. but to a certain extent there were certain things that I needed to get rid of. And I'd always wanted to do a half marathon and I thought, well, why not do it for a purpose? Mm. And for for that it was my dad. And, you know, I'm sure we'll go more into it, but, the way that he passed was the purpose behind me picking a charity to either put money towards or to raise awareness for yeah. because what they do is tremendous. And if not for them, I think it would have been a lot harder for myself and my family to go on. After your runs then, with that analogy in mind with the rocks, um, after your run does – do other rocks chipped away at, do you think? I think on the longer runs, yes, um, because, I, like, 23Ks is a long way. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's a long way. <laughs> and I remember the first couple of runs I was doing the first few weeks, I even rang my run coach. I was like, listen, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this because tonight I did 4Ks and I struggled <laughs> and 23 is just a tad more. Only like 500% more. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt Daniels, he's my run coach, he's a phenomenal man. And I didn't know a lot about him when I signed up with him, but he is just in his own league. He's so amazing. Um, but he was like, Beck you started at doing three minutes of running and two minutes walking. And we, we talk about it all the time now. I started at that. For me, I was like, that's nothing. That's boring. You know, I shouldn't be proud of that. But I went from that to running 23 three kilometres nonstop for two and a half hours of running. So I've gone from such a small amount to such a large amount mm. in a 20 week program. But that was because I made it my mission to be consistent and no, I know it's late, but I need to do my run today. Mm. And, you know, it didn't matter if it was nine o'clock at night, I'd say to my husband, right, kids are in bed now, you're home. I'm going for my run. And he'd go, um, it's really late. I'm like, I don't care. I haven't done it yet. It's on my program. I've got to do it. Yeah. Like I became real regimented and really focused on doing that. And, you know, not that I felt all that confident being you know, I'm not a vlogger or <laughs> anything like that, but having the camera up here and looking terrible and, you know, 
panting and you know but um I just felt like well a lot of people may be in the same shoes as me or may not grief wise but maybe a mum and Mm. needing time to themselves or having something just for them and I've had lots of messages since then saying oh you know I think it's so brilliant what you're doing I had a lady come and chat to me at my daughter's daycare I had never met her before and she had seen me and she said, can I just say, I really love that you do this. It makes me feel really happy to see someone going out and enjoying themselves and having time away from their kids. But you know, that you shouldn't feel guilty for that. Mm. I was like, you do, (laughs) but you know, it's an hour. You're not going to, you know, the whole world isn't crumbling because you're not there for an hour. They're actually fine. They need to see that too as well, right? Yeah. And even like now when I lace up my runners and walk out, my little son, he's only two, he's like, mummy, run, mummy, run, good. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And you doing that with, you you know, your face looking crazy when you're running, you've got your phone up, you're creating a safe space for everybody else to go, well, if she can do it, why can't I give that a go? Yeah. And if I look silly, (laughs) you'll look silly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And well, see, for me, everything since I've started reading about the brain and everything, what you've just done there is we rewired the brain. If you're if you're running 23K, that means your body was always able to do it. Yeah, it might not have been at the time, but your body was always able to do it. Because if you're I don't know how I don't know what your age is. I think we're similar ages. But let's say you're leaving it till you're 40 years old to run it. Well, that means you're 20. That means your 25 year old body could have done it if you trained your brain to do it. But you've changed your brain to do it later on in life or whatever it may have been or however many years ago you started. The point is that phone call when you said you couldn't do it, well, you change your mindset, you change your neural pathways, you train your brain to go, well, I can do this if I do it in small chunks rather than big chunks. It, you don't end up burning out, do you? It, yeah. It's neuroplasticity taking place right there and then. You and know? Like I was saying, my run coach, an amazing man, very kind, very, um, what am I saying, very understanding. Mm. Like he knows that if I rang him and said, oh, you know, Matt, I didn't do my run tonight. I'm kicking myself, but the kids are sick and blah, blah. He's like, it's okay. Yeah. It's totally. all done. Just take today, do whatever, do what you need to, look after your kids, and when they're better, go out and do your run. Like there's mm. no stress. Yeah. And the more I knew about him too the more he was telling me about his running because he was going to be there for great ocean road and i'm like oh you know how many half marathons or marathons have you done and he was telling me that he for 18 months ran a half marathon every day for 535 days i think it was and when he said it i was like I'm sorry, I don't know if I just heard you wrong. You say you did 535 half marathons, like day after day. He's like, yeah, and I had an accident in that time and all of this. I was like, oh, whoa, hell, hold on, hold on. I'm just coming back to the 535 and that you're running 21Ks a day. And he's like, yep. But to him it kind of seemed nothing because I guess it wasn't, it was, I think, about five years ago that he did it, but obviously he's done bigger and better things since then. Mm. Like he just said it like so nonchalant. I was like, that is huge. Why are you not like on a rooftop right now being like, I've done 535, you know. He's trained half- his brain. He's, like, he's... I did one and I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, he's rewired his brain though, right? And um, those when it goes on to the bigger, better things, the problem is what's the what's the next hill that he wants to uh what well, the next mountain that he wants to build, you know, counter. But he'll it'll be easier because it won't be as tall as it was if he saw it further down. Yeah, he's earlier just, on down the track. It sounds like he should be on leading our own way too. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. He's a he's definitely someone to lead his own way, that's for sure, and lead others. Yeah, he, beautiful. He, he has such a huge community. Um with his run coaching group. Um, Yeah, nice. And, you know, even what he posts is just, you know, he's pumping everyone up every day. Love it. Absolutely love it. Being like, yes, you you ran 20 metres, good job. You ran 200 Ks on the weekend, great, well done, you know. Yeah, nice. He's such a supportive man um, and good at what he does. Well, 
let's reach out to him. Let's get him on. Let's get him on. Let's do it. A couple of runs actually on the podcast. Um, my first guest ran 50 Ks a day for 30 days, sure. um, raising money for breast cancer. And the story behind that is phenomenal. It goes a lot deeper than just the running, but his whole professional life and family with breast cancer and then his wife and children. Oh insane but yeah had a couple of runners on here so we're we're not we're not new to the runnings that that would be good to have a different type of story on though that's for sure yeah uh, but back to you beck um so you're you, you've come across obviously very much like you've got this very energy and giving and wanting to go was you like that as a child where do you, where did it stem from very much so <laughs> <laughs> um i think if you tell my mum she's like you were a lot um <laughs> which karma has come 360 and smacked me right in the face with my daughter that's for sure is she the same as you oh yeah Looks but worse like, oh no not I think worse I, better i think <laughs> i think she, i was probably worse but um yeah she very much shows me the challenges of what i was like as a kid or, or i'll watch my mum watch her and she's just sitting back like <laughs> what what was childhood like for you then i was happy like <laughs> I, I can't ever remember, like, my parents, you know, yelling or being cross. It's not in a way that, you know, people are tra traumatised. Yeah. I, I very much lived a very privileged and lucky life. Like, um, you know, my dad was a glazier, mum was um, a nurse, mum worked a lot of shift work, a lot of night um, shift which as a kid we always had to be like really quiet in the house because mum was sleeping and couldn't have a lot of friends over on the weekend because mum was sleeping and mm -hmm. all of those things. So um, a lot of my sport was dad taking me there um, or I loved being outdoors. You know, I sit and think of how often kids are in front of TVs these days mm -hmm. and I can talk because my kids love the telly too, but they didn't have the space as well of what I had to, like I'd be outside riding my bike, you know, we were out in a little country town so you could, you know, ride into town, ride to friend's house, do whatever. I was outside with our chooks, with our dogs, um, mm. you know, building things with my dad, all of those things. I was always outside doing something and just having a way of a time. The issues that we have with the TV now, though, be, people can watch whatever they want, whenever they want. Whereas mm. back in the day, if you had a favourite TV show, you had to be in at that particular time. Yeah, and, and, and if you missed it, well, you might catch the rerun or the, the, the replay a few days later. But if you miss that one too, well, you've missed that episode. You have to kind of read about it in the in the TV magazine. <laughs> yeah, or you had to record it on your yeah, video record it, yeah. player and fast forward all the ads well i used to pause it when friends was on i used to when the ads came on i'd pause the recording do whatever i need to go run toilet get back and when the friends thing came on the screen back to recording so when i watched it back later that night because i'd probably i definitely watch it again over and over again that's why all that crackly would appear at the bottom of the <laughs> vhs tape of years later i wouldn't have to watch the ads i was pretty smart yeah, um, don't know how lucky they are now <laughs> no well yeah, but that's the thing, though. Is it lucky? The the, the amount of mental health issues. That, mm. I mean, the, we want to go to the top of the chain. I, I've spoken about. Privileged is a better word, I guess. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Priv yeah, probably privileged. But again, is it privileged if we're doing detrimental harm in their long run? They won't look at it like this until they're older. But, yeah. You know, I know we're going off the track here, but. Uh, we've we've gone off the track many times in our podcast when we talk about this, but I, th I think I've said it to you before, food and sleep would be the, the root cause of everything. Yeah. Right. But then the layers to that conversation down the track is all this social media and, and, and um, TV, delayed gratification, getting things when they want, when they want, when, you know, immediately and not thinking for themselves. I, I see the result of that in schools. You might too. But, you know, I am lucky enough to go to many different schools per week and I see the same issues no matter, no matter what the backgrounds are, no matter what the financial situation is. All these human skills are massive problems at the moment. I'm worried for the future. It scares the living daylights out of me a little bit. Yeah. But anyway, so being, a, being growing up with all that thing in my... Because you mentioned earlier about always giving. Um, where did that come from, always giving and wanting? Do, do you think that was installed from your parents or was it natural? Why did you give so much? I I think, yeah, from my parents. And I think that's why, you know, you hear so much in the media these days, like 
what you do as a parent, your kids are watching you. So yeah. when I watched my parents, they were very hardworking. So yeah. I've become very hardworking or I know that you have to work to get something that you want or need in life. Mm. Um, you know, I had my first job at 12. Um, I worked at the Colac Field and Game doing huh. trapping. Oh, and good. I used to get like 20 bucks. That was the best thing ever and you did it once a month. But, you know, I worked because I wanted to, but yeah. it was also my dad, um, he ended up being the president of that club later on in life, but he was very heavily involved from a young child with that club. His dad was a huge member. All of his brothers, um, you know, did clay target shooting there. He ended up teaching kids how to shoot in that in a program that they did and he did all the licenses, things like that, ran that with the police and other things, did ballistics training, um, all of that. So, you know, I saw the hard work there but also he knew everyone. And I think too having a business in Colac in a small town, you do end up knowing everyone because, you know, Tommy's uh, son just knocked out a window here and dad's got to go and fix it. Or, you know, my friends may have had a party on the weekend their friend and their parents didn't know that, <laughs> you know, they were having one and they've broken a window or a shower screen or something's happened and dad gets a call and goes out and does it. So yeah, you a lot of people. So I don't know, I always saw the friendliness there and he was a big, bold, funny man. Yeah. So I yeah. think I'm just as loud and just as out there and I feel like I know everyone or in some way one or another or mm. I make it my business to remember that kid's name and remember his mum's name and do all of those things. And that, that should be, I always say that to my son, you, you, these people looking after you need to know their name. Yeah. Basic, basic human skills, absolutely. You, you, we are very similar in the sense that I do want to be liked. I, I think for any, if you knew me a lot more, you probably sense, you probably would know that because it's been a, a topic in my life of always being liked, always want, wanted to connect with people. Um, so I see similarities in, in us both. Um, the confrontation, I used to definitely not sleep well at night if I'd felt like I'd upset somebody or if I'd said the wrong thing uh, or at least, you know what I mean? I don't know paranoia would set in and things like that um what how do you deal with how do you deal or I suppose cope with confront confrontation I guess a lot of it isn't that in your face confrontation it's the if you you know because of social media these days if it's you know text or you'd spoken to someone they go oh actually I didn't like what you s said or I didn't really appreciate that. It does throw me back and I get that guilt or, oh, why didn't I notice that they didn't like that or, you know, how can I make it better so that they're not feeling like that or maybe I'm too overbearing, maybe I shouldn't, you know, offer this or do this or whatever. Mm. And it does spin you out a bit. But I think at the end of the day, you can learn from those things. Like we say to kids in class, mistakes means that you're learning, you know, or if you make a mistake, you're going to learn from it. If you make a mistake, it means that you tried. Mm -hmm. So I'm fine to make mistakes and learn from those. But what I do from there, you know, is very different. So am I making that mistake and then learning that, that person probably isn't someone that I need to support like that or, um, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. I, you no, know, be everyone's cup of tea. Yeah, no, I, I, for me, that the issue that I have there is because we've invented phones, we've got this defense mechanism where we don't have the human capacity to go and have a difficult conversation. Um, does anybody, has anyone ever just said it to you or is it predominantly through a text or um, maybe not replying or in that sort of language? Uh, do you know what I mean? Like, why are we not doing having the, the, the confidence to come up and go, I wasn't comfortable with what you said. I don't know if you meant it that way, but this is how I felt. 
and then at least you can you mirror neurons in the back of your brain activate and you can sense it from the feel and the body language but when it's through a text it's all out of context mm. there's no picture towards it and they're using and I'm saying this because I can't get into trouble for it, you know, but I felt like, that. you know, why are we saying it through here or, or a horrible message through Instagram? Well, say it to me and we can sort it out. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, I agree. I think a lot of it these days is just through social media. I, I, not that I can remember that I've ever been confronted like that. Mm. Um, I think it's been mostly through text or just, you know, that ghosting of, they don't want anything to do with you and you're picking up on those cues. Mm. Um, but it does make you become more heightened about those situations, especially if you're going to see that person again. Yeah. Um, so I think, too, if I haven't understood something, I'd like to sleep on it and go over it and be like, well, could it have been this or could what I what I did be taken the wrong way or you know I need to explain to myself well what were what was your purpose when you did that thing for that person and they've responded that way mm. could they have interpreted that differently to what you intended as, as opposed it goes back to don't overthink it you go and be the person who asks it yeah right and and and, and and be the, the, that piece of advice that I just, well, not piece of advice, but, but the comments that I just made, right? I'm not going to overthink this because this is going to eat away at me. I'm just going to go and ask them, phone yeah. them, ask them, or meet them, ask them. I don't know. Um, bef I know this is not about, our episode isn't so much about what we were about to talk about. Um, it was, it's, it's more about obviously how you've um, led your own way from your father's death and passing uh -huh. um, and how you've, managed your emotions from that but we do go through the timeline of your childhood and early adulthood because it paints a picture of people's characters and um this is why i love doing this podcast uh, but when you was 18 years old you mentioned it early but you were diagnosed with diabetes type one and we've i felt it was important to talk about this because um not everybody handles these things this way i do see diabetes in children at schools more and more and more now whereas i didn't 10 years ago I, i've in my whole first eight years of teaching i saw one and they were in my class at one point and i knew that was coming um but since then it it seems to become a, a bit of a normality in schools and they, oh, they just have to go to the office to do the thing and that's fine uh, but with you you were diagnosed at 18 obviously that was um how many years ago was that? 20 years ago or so? Um, it was <laughs> one, I think about 17 or 18 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I don't, I didn't know the maths on that one. I was just throwing it out there. Um, yeah, we're about the same age. I'm a bit older than you. Um, so, and I want to bring this up because you have such a great response to this. And I think it is important that people see it, whether they choose to have that mentality and it's, there's, there's no, um, you know, um, for everybody else to feel like this because everyone will handle it in their way. But I feel like it's, you're creating a safe space to play on it. So talk to us a little bit about that time of your life and how you found out. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.